Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Norm, and I'm an alcoholic. But I certainly want to thank uh, Jim and Jack and Bert and the entire committee for the opportunity to be up here and to participate, to have the opportunity to share my experience, strength, and hope with you people that I might get in another day of sobriety, too. Uh, also, to say welcome to any and all of the new people that may be here this evening for your first 30 days in Alcoholics Anonymous. I <clears throat> want to extend a welcome to you. Uh, I'd be really surprised if there were a lot of new people that were here. Uh, this time of year, you know, we don't get a hell of a lot of new people. We're kind of in the lull, you know. Uh, we get a big influx of people coming in in February. They're the last of the Christmas holdouts. Uh, and then we kind of, you know, move out and we have a lull in there until summer uh, really hits the light wine and beer season. Uh, and we start getting a lot in about that time. We get some that are falling off and then it kind of moves out and we don't get too many in until the holidays. And they're out there training about October for the holiday period. And uh, we lose a few trainees out there and they make the program. But uh, in all seriousness, if there are any uh, new people that are here today for your first 30 days in Alcoholics Anonymous, obviously we're very happy to have you. And I'm sure that if you are new, you're aware of the fact you've now associated yourself with one of the most unpopular fellowships in the world. <clears throat> you know, nobody begins his life wanting to become an alcoholic and a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because, you know, frankly, there's not a hell of a lot of class to being an alcoholic uh, and not a great deal of status connected to it. And we don't issue out pins, you know, it says you're a 32nd degree alcoholic and you run all over the city, you know, and, you know I made it, oh, glad you made it, you know. <laughs> As a matter of fact, an alcoholic isn't even an alcoholic the day before he comes to AA. And the day before he comes to AA, he's a heavy drinker and a victim of unusual circumstances. But, you know, by God, I'm not an alcoholic, you know. <laughs> and uh, the whole practice of alcohol, you know, he goes to any length to prove that. Uh, he's not going to go to this program. He changes environments, jobs, wives, goes to jail. Some die. You know, man, I ain't going to AA. I'd rather die. <laughs> and he dies out there, you know. I'll show you I ain't going to meetings. And he's dead. And he showed us, by God. He's going to that. That's how unpopular this fellowship is. <clears throat> but now a few uh, survive. A few uh, use all that they can finally, that they can use. They try all the things that they can try out there, and they surrender. And they come in, and they become the survivors. And we here this evening, we're the survivors. And after you get in, you find out that probably this is what you've been looking for all your life. You find out that this is probably the best deal you ever had in your life. You find out you never have to take another drink again if you don't want to. You find a group of people who will know most everything about you. Who will still accept you. Who are not necessarily interested in where you've been or where you're trying to go, but they're awfully interested in what you're trying to do today. You know, that's a hell of a break for an alcoholic because when you're out there drinking, who's interested in you? Nobody was necessarily interested in me the last two or three years I was drinking out there unless they heard I was going to jail or leaving town. You know, then they were delighted over that. Isn't that marvelous, you know? People used to say to my wife, where's Norm? Uh, he's down in Texas on a job. He'll be gone about three months. Isn't that marvelous? You know, they, they're they always happy that you're the hell out of there and gone. You know, get him out of, get him out of circulation. Well, now, that, <clears throat> that kind of changes. Now, you come on in here today and you find out that people really care. If you're new, I can say that with all sincerity. People care. You want to do something about your drinking, buddy? We got the answer. As they told me when I came in, they said, here's the way it goes. You use that nickel therapy if you want help. You put the money in the telephone, you make the call, and you make the call before you take the drink. And if you'll do that, he says, you know what's going to happen? We're going to come down here to see you, and we're going to help you through this thing. And by God, they were people of their word. I put the, made the phone calls, and they came down. And they didn't sit there with that pity and hate that I've been used to all my life. They sat there with compassion and with understanding. They were guys from AA. That's got to be the best deal I ever had in my life. And I'm a guy that looked half the world out there trying to find the best deal. You see, I never found it, not really. Not until I got to this program uh, and was surrounded by this marvelous group of people that they would call themselves Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> For the benefit of the new people that are here this evening, why I want to qualify the initial statement I made. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination a consultant or a counselor or an authority on the program Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm an example, good or bad, that AA works, that it has been necessary for me to take a drink, steal anything, or go to jail now for over 23 years. Uh, I'm sure that nobody here tonight is overly impressed with that. I can tell. <clears throat> but I am, obviously. <clears throat> or I'd have never brought it up, you know that. <laughs> and you never know, hell, we may get a pension program going here in AA, you know. <clears throat> and if we do, I want to get credit for all my time, so I bring it up every time I have the opportunity. You know, I just I gotta sit around. I've got to tell you about it. Whether you ask me or not, I'm gonna tell you about it. But to new people that are here, this is tough to understand. You know, a new guy sitting there in his first month of meetings and he hears people talk about long-term sobriety. It's a difficult thing to visualize, you know, and I can 
I can go along with that. Hell, I can understand that. It hasn't been that long ago that I can't remember sitting in that first AA meeting. And I uh, was 29 years old. And to save you a lot of mental calculation, I'm 52. That gets that all taken care of right there, you see. Um, but I sat there in that first AA meeting, and I was 29. This guy stands up in front of the group, and he said, I haven't had a drink in uh, nine and a half years, and I like to fell out of the chair. I thought, Jesus, that's the biggest liar I've ever heard. How the hell could a guy go nine and a half years? If he just said nine months, I'd have said, hell yeah, how'd you do it? You know, I can understand, you know, nine months, but I couldn't understand a guy going nine and a half years out there, and I immediately became concerned. It became a nine and a half year program. I thought, what'll I do now for the next nine and a half years? Hell, my life's over. What will I do with all my time? What will my friends do if I'm not there to guide them through life? They'll die out there. That's what I get out. <laughs> and I kept going to meetings. And I found out that by God it's not a nine and a half year program. And that's why if you're new that they tell you, you know, you got to get to a lot of meetings because you find out a lot of answers. And that first 30, 60, 90 days, a lot of things are, are brought to light. And by God I found out it was a one day at a time program. Uh, that is now, that uh, that's what it's all about. They said, take care of the day, and chances are the week's going to take care of itself. And will a month, and will a year, and by God, that's the way my life is gone. And now almost 22, or over 23 years have run by. And it seems like yesterday that I was sitting there in those early AA meetings wondering why I was there, because as I mentioned, I wasn't, you know, delighted over the fact that I was an alcoholic going to AA. I, I thought, you know, why, uh, why am I here? Jesus, of all the things that could have been, why am I an alcoholic? It wasn't a vocation. So I didn't go down to my high school concert, and he said, you know, Norm, what would you like to be? And I said, an alcoholic. <laughs> and he said, marvelous, Norm. We got a new program for jackasses like you, you know. <laughs> I went up there toward the hill out of L.A. for the next 15 years, and I arrived. You know, I had completed the course. Well, that wasn't it. No, I sat there in those AA meetings, and I wondered, uh, you know, why am I alcoholic? What, what has created this problem? I come from a family of heavy drinkers. Everybody in my family drinks. I'm the only alcoholic in the family. Why have I been given the cross to carry the whole rotten outfit when I'm the best in the family? There was no question about it. You know, how many times I say, who's the best? You're the best, Arm, as you are. And then you say, well, if you're the best, then why do you go to meetings if your family doesn't? So you move on to something else after that. But uh, I was concerned. I come from that family of you know, heavy drinkers. My people are Irish and Italian. And I thought that had a big bearing on it. You know, Christ, you never fit, Norm. You, you look like an Irishman, you got that Guinea name, and you're coming out of East L.A., and it just don't work, does it? Now, that's the reason you got that uh, booze problem. You're jacked into it through your family, through your nationality, through your environment, people, places, and things. That's the reason I'm an alcoholic. Well, that isn't the reason I'm an alcoholic. You know it, and I know it. Oh. <clears throat> Being Irish and Italian, hell, all that means is you're not overly intelligent. That's all that means, yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely nothing else going for it. Because I was born and raised in L.A. What the hell? I don't mean anything, you know. <laughs> you might be a little flakier than most, but other than that, no. So, no, I'm an alcoholic because of the whiskey I drank. I figured that out by myself. That was a giant decision. You know, one day I thought, man, it's the booze. That was my problem, sure. I drank that whiskey out there as hard and as fast as I could drink it. And somewhere in that lottery of my life, I crossed the invisible line from the social aspect of drinking to the compulsive area. One's too many, a thousand aren't enough. Looking for the answer to living in a quart of whiskey and I can't find it. My whole life revolves around booze. People that sell it and people that drink it and after half a dozen drinks, you got no control. The booze was the biggest problem I had. That is me, right here. I'm the biggest problem right here because every, no, no matter where I go, I'm the first guy to get there. Is that right, Jerry? Sure. <laughs> All my problems all of my life have, uh, you know, initiated right here within myself. I'm the guy that stands out there and reacts and overreacts and never buys living on living's terms or want it my way. I'm the guy that's jamming and driving in there. This is where it begins. I got that alky personality, if there is such a thing. I'm a rationalizer, a justifier, a compromiser, and I got a rotten attitude. So what the hell you don't need anymore, do you? <laughs> I had all of that before I ever took my first drink. Traveled half the world and half my life, I made a complete ass of myself. I spent money I didn't have buying things I didn't need, trying to impress people I didn't like. You know, I think that's the story of most alky. You, know, you run all over hell to tell some guy you've never met you something you aren't. And you'll never see the guy again. You know, that's the incredible part. How am I going to follow up on him to see if he's still impressed? You don't know. I sat around them gin mills and talked to millions and spent in thousands and never had ten dollars. You know, I was you know, the high roller sitting there talking to all the general managers of the universe because I was one, you know. 
And the guy says, what do you do, Norm? Well, I do it all, man. That's what I do, you know. Yeah, aren't you impressed with this thing? I impress people. I, I drove the city in L.A. in the middle of the summer with the windows rolled up in my car to make you think I had an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> These things, you know, never change. I heard a story down in Texas years ago. You may have heard it, but by God, it was a story of my life. The guy didn't know it. It was told by this Texan about the blacksmith making a horseshoe. He pounds out the horseshoe. You know, he throws it down the ground. An old cowboy standing there watching that whole deal. And he reaches down and picks up the horseshoe. Quick, he throws it back down the ground. And the old blacksmith turned to him. He says, hot, wasn't it? And the old cowboy said, no, it doesn't take me long to look at a horseshoe. <laughs> It kind of sneaks up on you, doesn't it? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I was on a plane coming home and it hit me and I like to went to pieces. I thought, hey, Christ, that's the story of my life. <laughs> yeah, I've been running all over all of my life picking up them hot horseshoes, justifying the stupidity of my activities. Laying around on the sidewalks, dead drunk, and the guy says, you're drunk on the sidewalk, Norm. I said, oh, no, I ain't. I love sidewalks. That's why I'm here, yeah. <clears throat> a lifetime of justifying the stupidity. And I came to the program and I found out that those things were no longer necessary. I came in the AA and found out that hell, people aren't going to be impressed with where I've been or where I'm trying to go, not in AA. No, they told me right off, don't impress us here, buddy. We've been impressed by experts. Be yourself. And you know I don't get any more than that in the sobriety I've enjoyed here. I can say without reservation I'm overpaid because I've been able to spend a lot of days out there in that city street and all I've had to be is me. I haven't had to justify my existence or compromise my life. Isn't that a hell of a thing? All I've had to do is be myself. It's an experience that no alcoholic should be without. And by golly, if you're new, I suggest that you grab the package that's available to you here in AA, and you two take it out there tomorrow and experience a day just being yourself. It is an experience. Tonight, if I may, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I was like, what happened, what I'm trying to be like now, what the program of AA means to me, and, and some things that I'd use to stay sober. <clears throat> I don't bring up this past because I'm trying to impress you with the booze I consume or the problems I had. But I don't know a better way to talk about the program. When a guy says to me, how does it work? That's the way it works. One drunk talking to another drunk, and between the two of you stay sober. Between that and the AA book, that is the whole program as far as I'm concerned. I told you a great deal about myself. I'm a guy with an attitude problem, and if you've got an attitude problem, you've got a hell of a problem. Because life and living is a matter of attitude. You know, I wake up in the morning, I've got a rotten attitude, I've got a rotten day out there. If I don't change it, I could have a whole week, or a month, or a year. 1962, I had a bad attitude and a bad program, and I had a rotten year out there, man. It was just, it was all basically a matter of attitude. <clears throat> the bad attitudes is what started getting me into trouble long before I ever took a drink. I went to jail in uh, the first time in the late 30s. Not for drinking, for stealing. I happen to be a thief by trade. I'm an alcoholic by absorption. That's the way it worked out. <clears throat> Opened up the midnight auto supply down there in the San Gabriel Valley. Started popping them hubcaps, you know. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, finally make a little money and we started stealing cars. So hubcaps and cars. And it was a marvelous business. Low overhead and everything you turned was 100% gross profit. So, you know, how the hell are you going to beat that? You know, they're teaching that in school today. I always felt I was way ahead of them out there. <clears throat> in any event, <clears throat> I was a good pupil. I was a good thief. I was considered one of the finest car thieves that ever came out of the San Gabriel Valley. And we had a lot of good hookers out there in those years. You know, you, uh, you had to move to get ranked up in the top ten, I suppose. But... Eventually, the inevitable happened, and I was arrested, and I went in front of my first judge, and they got seven years in the Whittier Reformatory. And I was sent out there, but I wasn't out there long enough to wash my face. <clears throat> Some juice got in. I got a release, and I got put on probation, and I came back to L.A., and I had no change of attitude, so nothing's going to change. I'm looking for a fantasy land, a synthetic existence. In about 1941, I used to say 40, but I think it was closer to 41, about 1941, Easter week, Balboa Beach. That's where it all started. <clears throat> the Rendezvous Ballroom, Stan Kenton, and Padre Beer. Man, that's where she all got going down there. We'd, we'd suck on that old Padre, get a little buzz on, you know, and go in the dance hall and dance with the dollies and act four times drunker than what we were and <clears throat> breathe on them. You know, you got to let the girls know you got that booze out there. The, you know, the young high roller coming in, and they had a hell of a lot of fun. And I never got in a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, didn't get in any trouble in the beginning. But I kind of worked at that alcoholism. Uh, some people feel they're alcoholic from the first time out of the shoot. And I'm sure in their case there's no question about it, but I, I worked at it. I moved from that Padre beer to the Rainier Rail. From the Rainier Rail, I shot right into that, that whiskey. And when I got to the whiskey, I found the greatest thing made since money and girls, because uh, that 
Nancy on that, and that whiskey gets your attention right now. That's what I like about drinking whiskey, man. The, the first drink you take, it gets you downtown. Man, I want to get downtown. That, I don't want to be downtown after a while. Now, yeah, that whiskey gets you there right now. And I trained. I broke in on that old 10 high, and let me tell you, that, that old 10 high will get your attention, I'll tell you. So economically, you couldn't beat it. Sixty cents a pint, man, you felt every loving drop going down. It burned, grabbed, and tore all the way down and all the way up again. You know how, you know how it'll come up and run out your nose and make your eyes water. You know, you, you stand there gagging, one of your best friends is going, Ain't it good? Oh, Jesus, you're so good. <laughs> you can't breathe. That's how good that stuff was. But you hang in. That's the important thing. And the day comes when you can drink a pint of tent high and never throw up. And you feel, yo, I'm there now. It's all right. And I like the buzz and I like the taste of the whiskey. I liked everything there was about it. <clears throat> and there's fringe benefits. I heard this when I came to AA, drinking cheap whiskey. When you throw it up, you don't lose much. Yeah, figure it out. What the hell? You're paying ten dollars for whiskey and you're flashing ten dollars. There it goes. You know. <laughs> All over the ground, ten dollars. Why, right, that'll make you sick all over again, won't it? Sure. Now, I heard that from another alky. You know, you're new, you probably thought I made that up. I was original, but that ain't the way it is, nay, hey, nah. Anything you hear, nay, hey, that's good and usable is taken from somebody else. And you give that guy credit for it for three times, and after that, it's yours, buddy. That's the way it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's original. Well, this all happened in the latter part of 41. And that was right up here in the state of Oregon. I got in another jam in L.A. I violated my probation. I come up to Oregon. I went up. As a matter of fact, I jumped the freight and pulled into Salem and worked the hot yards out of Independence. And I worked some jippo logging uh, and uh, sawmills between Carvalis and Yahats and Newport Depot Bay and all that out there. And just go to them haystaker dances. You know, I just had a hello time and get beat up every other Saturday, you know. But I just hung right in, you know. But hey, this, here comes that city guy again. You know, there you go. <laughs> uh, well, I left. Uh, uh, and I got back down in L.A. about 1942, I guess it was. It was January of 42, and I had a hell of a time. I was dead broke, and I was on probation. And I turned and went to see my folks. My fo people went to the probation department. The probation department said, you know, we don't get, essentially is what they said, uh, we don't give a damn what he does, just get him the hell out of here. He can go to the service or go to jail. One way or another, get him out of L.A. County. And so I went into the United States Navy. We were in a state of war. I was in a state of shock, and that's the way it was. I felt, you know, with my kind of ability, I'd be the youngest lieutenant commander the Navy ever had. <laughs> and I was the oldest seaman they had, you know. I just couldn't get the damn thing going. Every time I turned around, when they got me hacked, I had three court marshals, I had a deck, a summary, a general. At 11 and a half months, a Navy brig up there on the top of Goat Island run by the Marine Corps. Had maybe 60, 70 days solitaire confinement on bread and water at different intervals and some other miscellaneous things are important, but all directly into the booze. I had a lot of shipboard time, consequently I had a lot of sober time. I did a good job, I didn't get a kick out. But that's the way it was. I didn't get kicked out because I was a hard worker, one sober. And aboard ship, I was sober a lot because the conditions were not conducive to doing a lot of drinking, and I got tired of drinking that sneaky Pete and that other stuff. Man, it uh, made your teeth black and it raised hell your bowels, too, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I didn't drink a lot of that, and I had a lot of good shipboard time and was able to come out with an under honorable condition discharge. I came back to Los Angeles in uh, 1946, and in 1946, I heard about AA. You know, God moves in strange, mysterious ways, and no matter what you do or you don't do, it's going to work out that way anyway, huh? How many times in my life I said, I'll never go there, I'll never do that again, I'll, uh, you know, I won't see that person, I'll, I'm not going to that city. And yet, through attrition, through a direction, through a power greater than myself, I find myself in these positions. And out of all evil, a certain amount of good has got to come. And in 1946, I made a statement to myself and to the judge in the probation department, I'll never come back to this dirty, rotten Pasadena again if I live to be 190. Because you guys are just, you know, you're a rotten bunch of people. You, I used to think they had an alarm system went around the town, you know, and every time I'd cross over, it'd go off. And they'd say, he's out there again. You know, they got me again. I had, you know, four arrests that year. I got a year suspended on a three-year probation. I was determined I would never go back there again. Never. A couple of months went by, and I 
was down one of the beach towns and committed a cardinal sin. While I was drinking, I began to think. And that's a bad deal for an alky. He should either think or drink, but don't get them both going at the same time. I got to thinking about that rotten judge in that lousy town. It's a free country. I'm going back. I went back. You know. I got a whole load on that night there in Pasadena. Went out and got in my car, drove one down one of the main drags. I couldn't have gone a half a mile. Car pulled in front of me. I couldn't see it, and I hit it and ran from the scene of the accident. I ended up <clears throat> maybe a couple of blocks away with the police forcing me to the curb, jerking me out of the car. And when I woke up in the morning, I was booked on a 501 felony, drunk driving, hit and run, bodily injury involved. And but for the grace of God, it looks like damn fools and drunks. Why, four people didn't die out there in the city street that night. You know, alcoholism is a game of seconds and inches, a few inches, a few seconds. That's all you got to talk about. I recognize that today. And when it gets to Salty, I don't think I can stand it out here. I like to remember. I like to remember that year of 46 and how I felt and how <clears throat> depressed I was and how the remorse dug and chewed at me and how scared I was when I stood in front of that judge that morning and he told me in no uncertain words that he had no recourse but to get me the hell off the city streets, that I was a disgrace to myself, my people, and the town and to put me into jail where I wouldn't harm anybody. And he sent me off to jail to do the year. And in the city jail, I shared a cell with a man who was going to AA. God moves in strange ways, huh? I went back to a town and drank that I said I would never go back to again, to go out in the middle of the night to hit a car, uh, to end up in a tank with a man that was going to AA. One guy got out of the bucket once a week to go to AA meetings. Out of maybe 200, 250 guys, one guy, he planted the seed. Once a week he'd go to a meeting, once a week he'd sit there and jabber about this AA thing. And I, he was absolutely sickening. I told him I... I don't want to hear any more about AA because I'm not going to AA and you're not going to take me to AA and I haven't got an alcoholic problem, I have a people problem, it's not the booze, it's the people. The rotten, rotten people out there, they're my problem. Now, let's straighten out the world, everybody goes the way I'm going, it's going to be alright, Sully, don't talk to me anymore. I am too young to be an alcoholic, you are 36, what is left? Nothing for you, everything for me. Ah. You are on the back side of the hill. You are through, over, and I believe that, yes. Hey, it's a place to go when you get so old you can't do anything else. That's it. <laughs> and I've used those words a thousand times, you know that. <laughs> and I went my way and he went his. And eight and a half years later, I picked up a telephone. I'm looking for a guy named Sully that I shared a jail cell with back in 1946. <clears throat> And I was looking for AA. And I found the AA program. But I never found him. Five years went by, maybe six. And I heard through the grapevine that he'd gone back to drinking. He couldn't hold the sobriety. And he went back to drinking after three years. And he went too long. He ended up having a wet brain. They put him up at Camarilla State Hospital. And they locked him up for the rest of his life. And they said, Norm, he's never coming back. And so I probably forgot about my friend. And I went on down the road. And then it was five years ago, last December, I was on a, in a Sunday morning meeting over in uh, Pasadena. Where the hell else would it be? Pasadena's in and out of my life, you know. I'm in this meeting in Pasadena. I looked down the front row, and who was sitting there was a guy named Sully that I chaired a cell with maybe 27 years ago. And I thought, Jesus, God, you keep moving in strange and mysterious ways, buddy. No matter what you do or I do, or it's just going to work out that way. And I thought, this is a revelation, and there seems to be some significance connected to it. And when the meeting was over with, they said, man, I owe you. You're the first sponsor I ever had. I want you to go to some meetings with me. Let me help you. Where have you been? He says, Norm, I got nine weeks in. I just got out of the county hospital. He says, I'll call you. And he did. And the Sunday following Thanksgiving, his sister-in-law called me, and she said, Norm, if he went back out there one more time to the gates of insanity or death, he had an internal hemorrhage, and he died before they got him to the hospital, to the gates of insanity, and then on to death. And I wondered, <clears throat> why, why, why? Why does there have to be the percentage of people that have to go back out and show the alcoholic can't make it? Why do they got to prove that once an alcoholic, you die an alcoholic, you never go back, you never can retrain, you can't regroup? Why is it that this is necessary? I don't know. I haven't the background, the education, the vocabulary to explain. I only know that these things happen, that if you continue down the road, that's the ultimate end of it all. <clears throat> Some messages there, I find it difficult to, to recognize it or understand it this day, but it's for some reasons, I'm sure. Well, I drank a lot of whiskey in that eight and a half years I was out there. Went to work for one of the largest construction firms in the world. I stayed with these people 11 years, and in that 11-year period of time, I was fortunate that I was at the right place at the right time. 
We had some 20 jobs going in the 11 western states, and I made a lot of them. And each and every time there was a new job that would break, I would have an advancement, and the responsibilities would get greater, and so would the money. And I needed the money about then, because I got a big overhead by now. I met and married a red-headed Irish woman, and she has got a violent temper, a rotten disposition, yells at me all the time, and is pregnant every other year. So we got a hell of a problem. I got herself in that shape eight times. It was incredible. I couldn't believe it. I, I used to sit around the bar stools and wonder, how can it happen? I'm rarely home anymore either, you know. But you can understand, we never had a great deal of dialogue around the house. I'd be gone two or three days, and I'd come home, and, uh, you know, alcoholics are very sensitive people. You know it, and I know it. Particularly after you've been drunk three or four days, you're exceptionally sensitive. You'll uh, walk in the house, and uh, you're tired. You've been very busy out there. <clears throat> and you'd like to be greeted with a little love, affection, and understanding. Isn't that right? So I walk in the house, and from 20 feet, Christ, she's yelling at me. You know, you're drunk again! <clears throat> now, that's a hell of a way to greet, greet a guy who's been gone for a couple of days, isn't it? Before she'd ever smell my breath. You know, I, could, I was always dumbfounded. I'd be in the phone booth and I'd call. And she'd say, you're drinking, aren't you? And I'd jump out of that phone booth. I'd look, where the hell is that guy, you know? I was sure she had somebody following me out there. Well, this is the kind of situation that I'm working against. I walk in, and as I said, she'd say, you're drunk again. And I'd say, who me? Like 37 guys at Wicked. You know who the hell she's talking to, but you gotta, you got to get her on the defensive. So you... Uh, you start out by uh, saying, do you know who you're talking to? Uh, and in case you didn't, then you introduce yourself to her. You know? <laughs> I'm old Norm, baby. That's who the hell I am. And don't you forget it. And then she'd mimic me. as the only way that my Irish can do it. I'm old Norm. That's who I am. You know, and Jesus, that upsets the hell out of you. <laughs> Sometimes that happens when you got your best friend with you, your new business partner. You know, you, you met him in the bar last night. You've invited him home. Come home, Jill. The reason he'll go home with you is, hell, he don't want to go home alone either. You know, he's scared to death of his wife, too. And then you're standing blind, leading the blind. And, I'd, uh, and, and then uh, I'd, I'd let her in on it. I'd say, baby, you embarrassed me in front of my best friend. I couldn't think of his name. And, and then I'd begin to let her know what a good deal she'd had. And I said, you know that home you're living in, baby? I built that, and don't you forget it. And all, all the food you're eating, I buy. And the clothes you're wearing, I buy all that. I, I mean, she's hysterical because she knows what the deal is. You're three months behind on a house payment. The kids are eating water on the post toasties, and she's standing in her wardrobe right there. Yeah, she knows the deal. <laughs> but you're impressing her. Yeah. And I'm saying you shut that Irish mouth and apologize, or I'm leaving. And she goes down and throws my clothes out. <laughs> Well, you have no recourse. You've got to save face or you pick the damn clothes up, right? You pick them up and you pack them out to the car. Jesus, yeah, the old clothes packing alcoholic's a joy to the neighborhood, isn't he? <laughs> you are better than gun smoke on the television, yes. Yeah. The old staggering clothes packing alky in and out of the house, loading up his car, honking his horn, honk, honk, I'm going, he tells everybody. Uh, zoom, down the street he goes. Two days later, zoom, there he comes again. <laughs> Driving in, you know, flat tire and all. Here comes old rim driver home, you know. The tires flopping and popping in there. He's in the car, you know. Jesus, the sparks are flying off of the rim. Turns the car into the driveway. Up in the lawn, opens the door, he falls out. There he is out there. Teddy Old Elk, he gets up off of the lawn and he says to himself, I wonder if anybody saw me. Yeah. <laughs> Alcoholics worry all the time about their reputation. <laughs> we, we, uh, we worry so much about our reputation, we lay around on lawns and in hedges and on sidewalks, in drum tanks, worrying about what people think about us. I wonder what they think about me. Yeah. <laughs> so you see, I, uh, I am married and a lot of adverse conditions. <laughs> It was very difficult for me to do any drinking around the house, and so I did all my drinking in the saloons. And in all honesty, I would have drank in the saloons anyway. I thought you had a water shortage up here, too. Thank you. <laughs> Don't pour it in my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can tell, I had a lot of problems in this marriage. And I like drinking in them bars because I like all the heavy activity. I like the dark lights. I like the rotten music. 
I like the smell. Kind of blew your sinuses out, Joe. <laughs> I like the intellectual giants I'm at there. You know, you, you never met a guy working for wages about midnight. <clears throat> we all sat around there and we talked in millions and spent thousands, I mentioned. We built the castles in the air and formed the corporations. We wondered what the poor slobs were doing tonight because the big money was all around us there, you know. <clears throat> and after you got tired of talking and lying to each other, you could sit there and look in the mirror. And you could talk to yourself. Yeah. Hey, who is more intelligent than you? Nobody is. No. And you, you stand there and talk to yourself, making all those funny faces. Yeah. You get that Maybelline look. You wind up. There I am. Oh, you devil, you. Yes. You wonder why all the dollies aren't down there at your end of the bar. Man, you got to go on tonight, don't you, huh? Yeah, you're good looking, well built. Yes, I'm well built. Look at my arm. You're a killer. Jesus, you're a killer, too. 150 pounds ringing wet in them days. <clears throat> Couldn't lick my lips, let alone anybody else, but. <laughs> But that whiskey brings it all out. It makes you a lover and a killer. You know, you're sitting there and you don't know what face to make. <clears throat> and that's just before you fall off the bar stool. Or, or you got to go to the men's room and you get in there to pay toilet and it's a difficult task. Uh, you know, you don't have the right change. So you slide under the door, huh? There's got to be some old door sliders here tonight, I'm sure. And you slide in. And when you get in, you know, and then you slide back out again. But you know, once you get in, all you got to do is open the handle and walk out. But you, but you never do that, do you? You know, no, hell no. If you go in, go out. There he goes. I don't know. That's degrading for a high roller, I'll tell you. you know. Takes the press out of your suit. A couple of guys waiting. You know, what are you doing down there? What is it? <laughs> And then the ultimate of your evening is that uh, you lose your car. We got a lot of car losers in AA. It's, we spend a lot of time, you know, trudging around streets and parking lots searching for our cars. And, and it's an emotional thing. Jesus, it really gets to you. You lost my car, you know. You call your wife. Did you see my car anywhere, you know? <clears throat> I think one of the highlights of an alcoholic's life is the night he finds his car. It's kind of a, you know, spiritual experience, really. You're, you know, you're walking down the street and it's, there's my car, you know, Jesus, you're overwhelmed with the finding that has been impounded, you know, the delight of finding your car. I, <clears throat> I used to lose mine occasionally out of Santa Anita. I only live about three or four minutes from the track. And I uh, have lost it many times out there at the track because when you come out of the track, and I always came out early because they threw me out, and you wonder, there's 20,000 cars out there, you know, a, a sea of cars. You're two-thirds drunk and all you can see is cars after cars and God, it just it tears you up. And I would always end up down there, there's a joint called the 101 Club, and you sit around there and talk to some other car losers. And then, you, know, you wait till the things to clear out. And I, I can recall walking out, you know, maybe 10 o'clock in the evening, and there in the middle of the parking lot, all by itself is your car. What an experience. What a feeling. There, car, there you are. Jesus. It's, it's, you open the door and you get in, you go to bed, right? <laughs> We got a lot of car sleepers in AA. You know, you see a new guy coming through the door, he's walking in like that, you know. <laughs> he's a car sleeper, yeah. He's had his head screwed up under the armrest all night, huh? He's had the door handle stuck in his ear. He wakes up four o'clock in the morning and he's sick. He thinks his window's down, it's up. Yeah, that laugh, huh? You ever try to throw up through your own window? You knock the hell out of your head. You sit there throwing up on yourself. You sit there saying to yourself, drinking fun. Yes. <laughs> and you're determined that next time's going to be different. Isn't that the old cliche of all alcoholics? Next time. Man, next time's going to be different. Yeah, when I get back down there, when they open that job again in Big Spring, Texas, man, I get back down there, it's going to be different. going to be all right. They love me down there in Big Spring. Or is it Dallas? Or El Paso? Or Moses Lake, Washington? Or Seattle, or Albuquerque. It was always going to be different. Next time, next time. It always was. It was worse. It never got better. <laughs> but I kept searching, like all alcoholics, trying to get the handle on it. Trying to drink like my old man and my brothers, the guys I'm running with, the people I'm working with, because I felt somewhere, someday, I'll find that absolute control. And as I trudged that road, <clears throat> the booze got every loving thing I owned and anything to me. I recall the day vividly that I drove home, you know, and on the way home while I'm scheming. As only the alcoholic can see. And by the time I reach the door, while well, the tears are coming down, and I'm saying, baby, baby, Jesus, give me a break. Don't throw me out. I got a hell of a deal, baby. 
I'm going down to see that priest, take a pledge. I'm going to see the doctor. Think of the kids. I'm going to do all them things for you, baby. Jesus, don't throw me out. And you scheme. One more lie, one more promise, and you get in. And as soon as you get in, you start scheming to get back out again, right? Now, well, then the day comes when there's no more scheming, huh? The day comes when she's <clears throat> not listening. Then that day, as I said, I remember vividly. I'm coming in, I got a pretty good hangover. I'm pretty sick. I pull into the house. I walk in, she's not even sore at me. She just said, Norm, you're a drunken bum, Norm. You'll never live to be 35 years old, eh? You're drinking yourself to death. The kids and I are neurotic because of you. I spent eight years sitting here looking through the front room window waiting to see a car come home. Night after night after night, I wait to see your car come home, Norm. <clears throat> and night you never come home. <clears throat> and I age and I die. And I hear the sirens run. And I scream, and I think the police got you again. Or this time they find you dead in the middle of the street, Norm, and you're never coming home, Norm. And I can't go through it any longer. You drag us down that gutter as deep as you're ever going to get us, Norm. Out of our life. You get out of our life. I've called an attorney. I've asked for separate maintenance. I put a restraining order against you. You don't live here no more. You get the hell out of our life. And I walked out, and I got in my car, and I drove away. And I said, why me? Don't we all go through it? Now, why me? And you know and I know, if you're an alcoholic, you drink enough booze long enough and hard enough, it's just a matter of time until it's going to get it all. Just a matter of time. The wheels of alcoholism grind very slow but very fine. You give it enough time to get every loving thing you own that means anything to you. Sure, there's the isolated cases where people come in and they still got it all put together, right, huh? So you got the woman, the man and the woman, they're walking in, they're going to their first day meeting, they're still together. What the hell? That's a miracle. Got to be a miracle. You know, oh. <clears throat> You look at that guy, he's all sick and hung out. You look at the woman, she's sick too, and in her eyes is a story. You read it there. Just this jackass has tried everything in the world. It ain't going to work. Nothing works for this guy. He's too dumb. No. He's too sick. He's not an alcoholic. He's worse. Hey, he's got nothing for him. And then you see the same couple, maybe two, three months later, walking through the door. Same door, same meeting. The guy, you know, he's kind of bought the package. He's sharped out. Looks pretty good. You look at the woman, she's changed too. And in her eyes is a story. It's a new story. It says, I've been waiting 20 years for this to happen, and finally it's happened. And today we're happier than we've ever been in our life. And it's all made possible through a unique miracle that you and I choose to call Alcoholics Anonymous. Yes. <clears throat> if you're new, this isn't something we guarantee. Don't get it wrong. No. This isn't something we have to offer. Huh? What we have to offer here is sobriety and a way of life. And whatever you are, you're going to be better at we don't guarantee you're going to make a ton of scratch or drive the big iron or live in the big house on the hill or your woman's ever going to call you home or your man, whatever the case may be. No, no. What we have here, sobriety, a way of life, you're a ditch digger, you're going to be a better ditch digger. And if you'll stick around and buy the package, your self-respect. And that a hell of a deal? Your self-respect. The sweetest thing I ever owned in my life. And it was taken away. A man walked in one day and says, Norm, you've abused the privilege of owning it. He took it away. He took away my self-respect. I couldn't buy it. Nobody can buy it. You can't check it out down some supermarket. No. It's not a commodity. The day comes, you know, you're standing there, looking there in front of the mirror, and you give all the money in the world, by golly, and your right arm thrown in, if you could feel good. If you wouldn't have that dying, digging, crying feeling inside, that remorse that was tearing you apart. If you could just look in the mirror and really look at yourself, you think, I'd give it all. <clears throat> that becomes maybe a psychological second in each other, in an alcoholic's life when he's sick and tired of being sick and tired. I don't know. If I had to isolate one thing that drove me to my knees and brought me into this program, I'd say it was the day I realized I had no self-respect. <clears throat> Nothing, everything else seemed to be secondary, just that lousy, rotten feeling. I still knew I could kill every man jack in town out there, but, you know, drunk or sober, but it didn't mean anything anymore. What they know about me, what you knew about me, didn't mean anything. It was what I, as an individual, knew about myself. And what I knew about myself was so lousy I couldn't think about it anymore. I got down to that bottom of the pit in the depths, I suppose. Uh, sick and tired that they talk about. And that was in February of 54. That drove me in, maybe. I'm sure it's an aggregate total of a great many things, but that feeling that you just can't tolerate any longer. That tired of hurting yourself. I called that central office in February of 1954 in Los Angeles looking for this buddy of mine named Sully. 
And he said, we got a lot of Sullys and a lot of Sullivans in AA. He said, it's an Irish allergy, buddy. We got all kinds of men here. But, and he couldn't help me. He said, but if you want to do something about your drinking problem, he said, we can help you there. He said, how much we can do? He said, yeah, I'll give you some phone numbers. By God, and you can call these people. They'll come out to see you. He said, they'll sit down and they'll explain AA to you. And they'll take you some meetings and they'll show you a new way of life. And are you interested? And I said, him. He said, fine, here's some numbers. And so I started calling. Pretty soon I got a hold of a guy. He came out to see me. And my sponsor was one of them hard-hearted sponsors you hear about. You know, went to school for hard-hearted sponsors. And his attitude about AA was, you wanted to, you had to want AA as bad as you wanted the booze. And that's the way he paralleled it. He said, you went to any length to get the booze, buddy. That's the way you got to go about AA. He says, you know, uh, you need us. We don't need you. You remember that now. Yeah. He said, you lied, cheated, conned, stole. Walk, drove, you went to any length to get that whiskey. He says, you go to any length to get this AA, that's what it's all about. He said, hell, there's guys in the city who'll come and pick you up and take you to meetings. He says, I don't believe in that. That's a softer, easier method. You want to come and get it, boy. You got a car, you drive. He says, frankly, you got a car, hell, you ain't ready for AA yet. No. <laughs> he says, we take chances on guys with cars from time to time. Yeah, we'll chance it, all right. <laughs> He said, if you don't own a car, he said, you can take the bus. And if you haven't got bus money, son, he said, you can walk. And isn't that bad a deal? He said, how far did you walk for whiskey? I said, a long way. He said, you walk a long way for this sobriety. That's the way it is. He said, you ain't going to get everything back overnight either. <clears throat> Just become the AA, coming to AA is going to solve all these things overnight. He said, you remember, it took you 15 years to get yourself in the shape you're in. You did it one day at a time. You went right down the chute. He said, you're coming back out the same way, one day at a time. Yeah, you're going to get out of it about the way you got into it. He said, those guys will clean up their action maybe in five or six years. He said, but they got a good attitude. And he looked right at me when he said that. <clears throat> and that upset the hell out of me again. And the only thing I liked about him by now was when he said, if I can make it, you can. And I thought, ain't that the truth? Yeah. Yeah, if that rotten old man could make it, anybody could make this thing. Yeah, I'm convinced. But I can hardly wait for that night to come, to get in my car, to drive down to that meeting. He'd be there in the parking lot. I'd crash him with my car. That's what I'll do. Yes. And I went to my first AA meeting in spite of myself and in spite of my sponsor. And it was a God-directed thing. There's no question about it. Boy, I got in that car and I drove down to that Temple City meeting. The old Temple City meeting in those days used to meet down in Rosemead. Used to be in the Legion Hall. On the corner was the liquor store, the Legion Hall. Next door was the cemetery. The cliche in the group was, you get by here, stop here, you won't make it over there. You know. <laughs> They'd show all the new guys in the cemetery. God damn it, you're going to die. Ah, ah. Isn't that funny? I think it was very funny. No new guy thought that was very funny. Alcoholics got a warped sense of humor after they get sober, yes. <laughs> I'm subjected to more of this sense of humor. There's a very wealthy group. We had so much money in the group, we had donuts before and after the menu. Can you imagine that? Hell. Yeah. And we'd buy three or four of these red jelly donuts. We saved them red jelly donuts for the new guy. And the newcomer coming through the door, the Red Jelly Donut Committee, slide up on him, you know. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Are you new? Ha, 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 yeah. How would you like a cup of coffee and a Red Jelly Donut? Ha, ha, you know. <laughs> Did you ever look at a Red Jelly Donut when you got a hangover? <laughs> it gets you right there. I don't want it. Oh, thank you very much, but I don't want your donut, no. It looks like something I left on the street last night, yeah. Did you ever look at a red jelly donut when you got a hangover? <laughs> it gets you right there. I don't want it. Oh, thank you very much, but I don't want your donut, no. It looks like something I left on the street last night, yeah. <laughs> and they all laughed about it. And then the meeting began. And typical of an AA meeting. And a guy stood up there in the front of the group and he told everybody what a jackass he was to become hysterical. The old L.A. Central Avenue group with the whole meeting on. And this main talker they had that day. He talked about going to jail and people beating him up. The more he go to jail, <laughs> and the more they beat him up, the more they'd laugh about it. He talked about drinking something called Jamaica Ginger, giving him the Jake Lake, crippling him up so bad to put him in a hospital for two and a half months, and they were hysterical. Jesus, they thought that's funny. <laughs> and my sponsor's a nudger, and he said, they're going, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Get off. Oh, God. All sponsors are nudgers, you know. If they're not doing it, your wife is, you know. <laughs> they think you're deaf, but I'm listening. I can hear, I can hear. And I can hear all of it. But I'm having difficulty in some identification. 
The guy's lost me. And if there's anything I can identify, but hell, he's lost me. I can't qualify for AA. What the hell? I'm premature. I got no story. I got nothing to tell anybody. At the very outside, I've been in maybe 25 jails, I drank a little Vitalis. What the hell have I got to tell anybody? <laughs> And this guy made a big statement that night, and I think it's so very important. He said, it don't make any difference what you drank, buddy. And I thought he was talking right to me. He said, it don't make any difference what you drank or where you drank it, to the amount you consumed or how old you are. He said, it's what it's doing to you. And if it's tearing up any part of your life, you don't have to go any farther. And when he said that, I wanted to come out of the chair. I don't want to tell him, buddy, you better believe it. It's tearing hell out of my life. I'm tired of hurting myself. I don't want to go through that crap anymore. And as I looked at that guy, as I thought about it years later, probably what was going through my mind was that <clears throat> there stands it all. There stands an example, by golly. If I want some kind of sobriety and semblance of sanity in my life, I'm going to find it right here. I looked for it all over the world out there, and I never found it, not till I got here. By example, as the program has shown, there it stood. The old cliche, what he is, speaks so loud. I cannot hear a word he says. By example is the program, Alcoholics Anonymous. If you like what you see, you come back to find some more, isn't that right? Stood that man that night with an identification purpose, and I had the identification, and I knew deep inside, by golly, here it is. I've probably been looking for this the last decade of my life, yes. And well-meaning people had tried to hand it down. My own woman, you know, time after time and year after year, say, Norm, knock it off. Norm, knock the booze off. Norm, you're killing yourself. Norm, you're destroying the family. Norm, you're destroying the children. Norm, for Christ's sake, stop. And I stand there with tears in my eyes, and I say, baby, baby, Jesus, I'm gonna. Pretty soon. Later on. Tomorrow and tomorrow. And each and every year, I'd go home, and I'd see my people. And my own mother, year after year, I'd say, Norm, Norm, Jesus, quit the drinking, Norm. And I'd say, baby, baby, I'm going to knock off the booze. I'll break your heart no more, baby. Really. Tomorrow, later on, pretty soon and pretty soon. And I tried to get it. I tried to grab the handle there, but the identification, you see, had run past. And <clears throat> there wasn't the identification. There wasn't that they had been to the place that I had been. They hadn't seen the things that I had seen. They hadn't felt the way I had felt. They hadn't hurt them with the remorse that I had hurt with. <clears throat> and so I couldn't identify. I wanted to quit drinking for them, and I couldn't do it. And that night, though, I looked up and I saw, there stood a man who said, would you like a better life? I like to believe he was talking right at me. I like to believe what he said was, Norm, you're new, Norm, how are you? I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you sobriety. I'm going to give you Alcoholics Anonymous, Norm. Here it is. And he handed it down. And I reached up and I took a piece of it. <clears throat> yes, just a piece that night. As I sat there that night, I wasn't so sure I wanted to quit drinking. I was tired of hurting myself and I knew, by golly, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to find some better way to operate. The only other thing I took away from that meeting that night was that, that that guy had sobriety, that that guy had been out there and he knew what he was talking about. He'd come off of them city streets out in L.A. talking about 75th and Figueroa in that area and I knew what the hell. And he was a street man and I know all about them L.A. streets. And he knew what the hell he was talking about, yet there he stood, not a street man, but clean, sharp, happy, smiling, his eyes clear. And he, he had a set of threads on. I bet them threads cost the guy $150. You know, and I thought, man, if he didn't get nothing else from me, didn't he get a set of drapes out of it? Boy, that's all right, yeah. <laughs> and I am impressed with this thing that I see. I was impressed with that, and I was impressed with the fact that his woman, she said, had divorced him and remarried. And his kids, they all hated him. But he said one day his kids came down to see him, and they learned to like him, to respect him, and to love him. And if I'd have looked around, you know what I'd seen? I'd seen a half a dozen of these big, tough AA guys sitting there in that AA meeting, and the tears were in their eyes. They cried, and they cried. And there was a story. They laughed because they were miserable, and they cried because they were happy. <clears throat> and they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. And maybe that's oversimplification, but it's... It's the way I work my program. You see, I don't know, a, I don't know a, a better way to clear away the wreckage of my rotten, lousy past, a better way to, to move that crap out than to be able to laugh a little bit about it, huh? To be able to laugh. How do you start moving it out? Because when you come into AA, there's nothing to laugh about. I sit around in meetings and I hate laughing. I'm never going to laugh. I told my sponsor, I ain't never going to laugh again. Never, 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 no. And then one night I'm sitting there going, <laughs> Oh, Jesus, I did it. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I laugh. Don't tell my sponsor I laugh, whatever you do. 
But once you begin, uh, a whole new attitude comes out. A whole change. By golly, it's like you took 150 pounds off your back. You start to move away the wreckage of your past. You put yourself out there in a position to grab the package. The whole package. You make that transition, huh? You quit taking, Norm. You start giving. That's difficult for people like me. Because I never give anything to anybody in my life. What the hell for? I'm a taker. I'm a taker of things and a user of people. I'm a... I'm a loser. All takers are losers. You're looking at one right here. I thought I had the key to happiness out there. Hell, I never had the keychain. Not really. I never knew what it was all about. Not real happiness until I came into the program and the man said, it ought to be totally happy, Norm. You got to give away what you found. You didn't buy it. You can't sell it. You got to give it, Norm. And the, you know, <clears throat> the more you give, the, the better it is and the more you keep. And the reward is insurmountable, Norm. That's not even in a material sense, but in a sense of well-being will guarantee you the world. Being able to walk down the street and feeling good all over because you made a 12-step call to the guy last night. You give a little to yourself to him so he can give it to somebody else and he to somebody else, Norm. This is giving. Your destiny is predicated on the amount that you as an individual are willing to give away. And I believe it. That sense of well-being I've been able to feel since I've been in AA from time to time is inexplainable. It's the same kind of feeling I had when I drank out there, but when I drank, it was a temporary thing. I used to drink and get that buzz on, and then drink a little more. I get real buzzy all over, and I hit that plateau, and I'm buzzy, man, and I'd order one more just to stay even. Bam, down the chute I'd go, and I'd wake up in the morning and the buzz is gone. And in his place is a friend of mine. His name was Remorse. You remember him? Yeah, every day he tore my guts out. <clears throat> and the only thing I ever put him on in my life was whiskey or Alcoholics Anonymous. I traded in the whiskey for the sense of well-being I've been able to find here. And all I've had to do is be willing to be willing to give a little for the hell of it and want nothing in return. The no compromise kind of giving you and I understand here in AA. Not the kind you twist, turn, and use, but just the kind that you give. You give for the pure hell of it, and you really don't want anything in return. To me, essentially, this is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd love to tell you that every day is a holiday and every meal is a banquet since I've come to this program. But I've gone through the growing pains. You know, that beginning of that first year, geez, it was a tough year. Second year I went to, damn near the last. What's the old timers mean in Pasadena? Where the hell else would I go? Yeah. I had to be sober 10, 10 years to read the steps. The speaker that night, been in AA, 137 years, yeah. <laughs> old Artie. And I'm, I'm sure Bert remembers. When old Artie spoke, he always showed a picture of himself. It was a great big blown-up mugshot taking him when he's doing time in the county jail. And the point that Artie tried to get across was, look at me when I'm drinking, look at me now. And I looked at that picture, I looked at Artie, and I thought, crazy, he looked better drunk, that guy did. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to get the hell out of this age. Hey, hey, you know. <laughs> it ages the hell out of these guys. And I went out the next day, bought a pint of whiskey. <clears throat> I took a drag out of it and I threw it away. And I went to my third meeting, which is the Arcadia group, which became my home group. The fellow was leading the meeting that night was a guy named Marky. <clears throat> Mark's sister-in-law is here tonight. <clears throat> Hell of a guy. He kind of took me in hand that night. He introduced me to half a dozen other guys. We started going to meetings together, having meetings after the meetings together. You know, the coffee shops and meetings after the meetings, they're the best ones. You get them in-depth inventories taken that way. <clears throat> we found out there were a lot of cliques in AA. We formed our own clique to be against the other cliques out there. <clears throat> and that uh, we found, too, they had a lot of flaky people in AA, a lot of bad leaders, speakers, secretaries. In order to change that, well, we would have to run one of our guys for secretary, and so we waited around for a year, run a guy of ours for secretary, <clears throat> in order to change the whole complexion of AA in the San Gabriel Valley. <clears throat> We went down to Baldwin Park in El Monte on election night, imported some friends to make sure our friend got in, you know. <laughs> and by God, he did. He became secretary of that group by a landslide. And a week later, he joined the other cliques. Yeah. Now, won't that tear the hell out of you, you know? But then you come to find out that the only cliques in AA is a click, click, click it in your head, isn't it? You come to find out that all there is in AA is people. People from all walks of life, isn't that right? <clears throat> people I wouldn't do any drinking with, and obviously there's a hell of a lot of people that do no drinking with me. There's some people that I'm not going to share all my sobriety with them, and they're not going to share all of theirs with me, but the beauty of it all is, as a friend of mine says, there's not a man or a woman in this program would dislike me so bad he'd like to see me take a drink. Isn't that a hell of a deal? Would I call him up and say, Charlie, for Christ's sake, I've got to see you? He'd be there? 
Now, he may disagree with everything I stand for in my work life, my AA life, my business life, my messing around life, my fringe area life, or whatever. But what to call him up and say, Charlie, will you come? He'd be there. He'd sit there with compassion, with understanding. He'd try to help me. Because he wouldn't want to see me go back out in that jungle and get torn up in that grinder one more time. He'd be down to relieve. He'd be down to help. And that's got to be a hell of a deal. That's got to be the best deal I ever had in my life. And as I mentioned before, I looked half the world out there trying to find the, the best deal. <clears throat> and as I say, every day has not been that holiday. The good and the bad. My sponsor says you're going to stand out there and be counted, Norm. <clears throat> you got to be now. He says there's no more excuses now, Norm. you got sobriety in the way of life and the equipment to be counted out there. Take the good days, Norm. Take the bad days. Because you belong to AA and you got some time in doesn't mean you're exempt. He said, that's the way it's got to be. He says, the old shooter upstairs never gives you more than what you can carry, and that's a fact. He gives the big loads to the big horses and the small ones. He always gives the guys the norm. That's the way it is. <laughs> right. But it's still damnable difficult out there, isn't it, huh? Some days, God, you hurt. Some days you get physically down. Tough to be grateful, huh? Some days you're dead broke. Tough to be grateful when you haven't got that scratch in your pocket. Huh? God knows I know. 1962 is the worst year I had. 1962, I'm eight years sober out there. <clears throat> I find myself in a bad position. I find myself in a bad program. I let my ego overrule my good sense. I find myself in a business venture with some people that I got no business being in with. No, I'm out of my class. Let me tell you, those guys ate my lunch out there in 62, you know. I thought that I come from the high rollers out of there, but man, they put me right in there. In 1962, I was in the worst financial shape in my life. Far worse than when I came into the program. And it starts eating at me, and I got this bad program going. And then the next thing you know, I got an honest desire to take a drink, huh? Yeah, I feel like whiskey going down. I got that Arab thirst, man. I can taste that whiskey. Not once, but a dozen times that year. I got that thirst. And I find myself in a gin mill down in Miami Springs, sitting on a bar stool. In a world I got no business being in. I'm in the drinking world. I don't know belong in there. Oh, no, I'm going to be there. It doesn't bother me. No, I'm sitting on the bar stool. The bartender comes up and says, what do you have? I says, give me a double. There it is. <clears throat> but I didn't reach, huh? The old shooter upstairs didn't find it necessary to, to snap that angel off my shoulder. He gave me another shot. He took me back for a minute, I suppose, and let me remember who I was and where I came from. Maybe he says, Norm, for Christ's sake, in your life, everything from the county jail is up for you, buddy. Oh. Quit crying the poor mouth, Norm. Don't you remember what it was like out there? Huh? You think it's tough today? Don't you remember laying in that tank in Big Spring, Texas on the dirt floor and the cockroaches are running over your head and you're laying there three days whether they let you make bail? Don't you remember hitting that car that night and such kill four people? Don't you remember the night that your wife's begging you not to leave the house because the, the fourth kid is on the verge of dying and you can't stay? Don't you remember? Give me the strength to remember. I say, God, give me the strength. That's all I ask. Give me the strength to remember to say thank you. Let me remember who I am and where I came from. No matter how salty it gets out there. Let me know inside that the big crosses to the big horses and the small ones to guys like you. Instead of crying a poor mouth, take a minute out of your busy day, Norm. Look down the street. What do you see down the street? You'll see a man carrying a load ten times the size of yours. He carries his with great dignity. He doesn't find it necessary to cry the poor mouth. He just said thanks. Today I say thanks. Thank you, people. Thank you, my friend, for the 23 years you gave me. For the 23 years you let me walk out there on the sunny side of the street. What the hell? I'm overpaid. I know guys never saw 23 days. I know guys died out there in the street of booze and fantasy, busted dreams and broken hearts. I know guys that died justifying their existence. They were coming from behind all their life. Because when I drank, I came from behind. They had the heat and the screws on me every day of my drinking life. I justified every rotten thing I did out there because I got the heat on. 23 years, no heat. 23 years. I've been able to walk out there in the sunshine. I'm overpaid. Been able to feel my respect and be respected by people. Be able to do a job. Be the competitor. Be in the jungle. Be able to go home at night to a house where I live. Walk in the door. Be respected in my own home by my woman, red-headed Irish woman. Glad I'm coming in. Respects me because I'm her old man. <clears throat> Nobody cries in my house today because their old man's drunk and tearing it up. Haven't heard a kid of mine scream at me for years for me not to hit their mother. Watch them go from small bandits into big bandits. Send them out to schools. Watch them get some education. 
taking daughters downtown, bought them their first pair of high heel shoes, seen them move from chickens into women, put them in prom dresses and seen them blossom out, seen them jackasses come to the house, take them out too, yeah. <laughs> Man, they get jerkier every year. Jesus. <laughs> there was one got there about five or six weeks ago. I, Hello, Mr. Alfie. How are you? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I almost threw up when he walked in the house. I, I told my daughter, I said, there has got to be something better than that out there. there. <laughs> Hold on. Either I'm getting older or they're getting worse. I don't know what it is. And I've had the opportunity, though, to like the first wedding, to take a daughter down an aisle. It's a hell of an experience. You know, send invitations out and people come. 400 people sitting in the church one day. Uh, I remember the day I could send invitations out to 400 people to come to see me shot. Nobody comes up. <laughs> this day, 400 people sit out there, and the music begins to play. And a chicken walks out of the door all dressed in white, and she sees me, she starts to cry. And she makes me cry. And we're walking down the aisle. I look out there, there was 80, 90 of my A buddies. Man, they're all crying there. And the A guys cry better than anybody else. Isn't that right? Uh, <laughs> And they're not crying because of the misery of it all, they're crying because of the beauty of it all, because of the happiness they feel, that they feel for me and that I feel for them. The happiness and the feeling one alcoholic has for another. A happiness that's so very difficult to explain. It just says, Norm, today we're respected by the human race because we are part of the human race. Today we're not in a room filled with people and by ourselves today we're in people, in a room filled with people and we are the people. We are the action. I am the action. And you are the feeling. And you are my friend. You are the alcoholic that came out <clears throat> and has been reunited with respect also and I love you for it. And how do you explain those things? I can't do it. I haven't the words to express it. I can only say that every loving thing I am is because of this program that has been a long walk from the L.A. County Jail to the point that I stand today. And but for the grace of God, Alcoholics Anonymous, and friends like you here tonight, I could have missed it all. Thanks a man. God bless you. <laughs>